one of the things that changed dramatically was the length. Uh, the very first cut of John Logan's script that was shot was um, at least 45 minutes longer than the, than the final cut. It was just a very, very long piece of film. And uh, we went through the process, which is not uncommon, of, uh, of slowly whittling it down to, uh, to a length of slightly under two hours where it is now. Uh, so there were certain things that were painful to give up. But I think all in all, there's, there's really nothing that we took out that uh, didn't belong to be taken out. There is a <clears throat> very important scene that uh, follows on the wedding when uh, Picard and Data over a glass of Chateau Picard um, talk about uh, those aspects of life that are about change, necessary change, evolution, loss, friendship, um, and family, of course. This is particularly poignant for Picard because presumably Riker and Troy will have children. What a thought. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, Picard never married, never had children. His life has been uh, the Federation, Starfleet, and the Enterprise. His children are his crew. I don't mean to be sentimental about that, but, but it's true. And I think he has um, a somewhat paternal relationship with every member of his crew. And now it's changing, and they are going on to new adventures, whereas Picard is staying where he is. And perhaps a feeling that life is passing him by. Of course, he has to talk like this to Data, because in many respects, Data doesn't understand these feelings. He's a machine and cannot, uh, cannot be expected to have that sort of sensitivity to the changes of life. But the conversation that Picard and Data have there is one that will resonate through the movie and become very, very potent in the last 10 or 15 minutes of our film. For a special occasion, Chateau Picard, 2267. You know, they say a vintner's history is in every glass. The soil he came from, his past, his hopes for the future. Hmm. So, to the future. To the future. an interesting confluence of emotion at the wedding. I could not help wondering... Sit down, Data. Thank you, sir. I could not help wondering about the human capacity for expressing both pleasure and sadness simultaneously. Certain human rituals, weddings, birthdays, funerals, evoke very strong and very complex emotions because they mark important transitions in our lives. They denote the passage of time. Not just the passage of time, but the presence of time within us. They make us think of our mortality. These occasions encourage us to think about what's behind us and what lies ahead. And you were particularly aware of this feeling of transition because Commander Riker is leaving to assume command of the Titan. Well, Indiana joining the Titan. Beverly going to Starfleet Medical. And this makes you sad. Well, yes, I suppose it does. A bit. I mean, I'm very happy for them, of course, but I will miss them. The Enterprise will seem yeah, not the same without them. That is because you are used to their presence. Their 
proximity brings you comfort yes and frankly i almost envy them they made important decisions great challenges lying ahead of them new new worlds seeing will and diana today made me think about some of the decisions i've made devoting my life to starfleet not marrying having children all the choices that led me here the choices i have made have led me here as well sir this is the only home i have ever known i cannot foresee a reason for leaving oh data you never know what's over the horizon before long you'll be offered a command of your own if i were i believe my memory engrams would sense the absence of your proximity sir i would miss you and are you data now you make a toast to to new world sir to new worlds One of the scenes we cut out was a big scene in the, in the Senate, which is a nice set, and it was a nice, a nice enough scene. But it introduced, in the film, um, Shinzon. We saw Shinzon before we had the reveal down the steps. So that was an obvious lift to me. You know, if we've had this scene where we've already seen him, how can, you, how can the audience be interested with this mysterious reveal. I know Patrick hadn't seen him, but the audience has to be Patrick. So we took that whole scene out um, early on, you know, that went, because it's a much stronger moment, cinematic moment. We're talking about this Shinzon, who is he, what's he, you know, they don't even know he's human. They know he's a Riemann, you know. So when we see him at the top of the stairs, we don't really see him too well. When he comes on the top of the stairs, he reveals himself. It's a much more powerful, dramatic moment. There's a bunch of other scenes that we took out that really didn't help the story forward. Fleet commanders are nervous. They've agreed to remain at their given coordinates and await his orders. But they're anxious to know what's going on. I don't blame them. We can't keep them in the dark forever. But in darkness, there is strength. Don't you agree? Consider it the great symbol of the Empire. But the bird of prey holds two planets, Romulus and Remus. Their destinies conjoined. Yet for generations, one of those planets has been without a voice. We will be silent no longer. Join us, commanders. Now, what's the disposition of the fleet? They're holding position. And? They will obey. Traitor. It is imperative that we retain their allegiance or our great mission will be strangled before it can truly draw breath. They support your intentions, sir. But they require evidence of your, well, shall we say, sincerity. And they'll have it. Tell the fleet that the days of negotiation and diplomacy are over. The mighty Federation will fall before us, as I promised you. The time we have dreamed of is at hand. The time of conquest. Cut off the dragon's head and it cannot strike back. And how many warbirds will you need to slay the dragon? You don't approve of my oratory. Pretty words are of little use in battle. In any event, I will need no warbirds. Praetor, you have the whole fleet at your disposal. They supported the coup. They'll follow you. The scimitar will serve my needs. But surely you... I came this far alone. We 
came this far alone. We require no assistance from the fleet. Now leave me. shields and go to red alert not quite yet mr wolf captain permission to speak freely go ahead the romulans live only for conquest they are a people without honor we are alone well within their territory i recommend extreme caution for better or worse this is a diplomatic mission and i have to proceed under federation protocols but i can assure you the first sign of trouble, those protocols will no longer apply. Aye, sir. I would say he's been trained to resist telepathy. What I could sense of his emotions were erratic, very hard to follow. Is he sincere about wanting peace? I don't know. The strongest sense I had was that he's very curious about you. He wants to know you. Does he indeed? Captain, your feelings are appropriate. The anger I sense in you is... Can you imagine what it was like standing there, looking at him? What you're feeling is a loss of self. It was as if part of me had been stolen. We cherish our uniqueness. We believe that there can be only one of us in the universe. Now there are two. There were two rapes in it. There was another rape in it, which we had to cut out because, um, or we decided to cut out, we didn't have to cut out, we decided to cut out. And there was another one. I used a snort, a, a, an interesting angle. Um, she walks into an elevator and then suddenly he's there. Well, you can do it with just cuts, but I decided not to do it with cuts. So we see her walk in, so we're behind her, and we see she walks in, there's no one in the elevator. And then when she walks in, we have a snorkel camera, you know, a snorkel camera, so it's looking down on her. And as she turns round, as she, we, we travel round her, we've already seen there's nothing in there. And as it comes round a full 360 degrees, he's suddenly there behind her. He's in and she's shocked, and we go in, and then we, we came down um, as she is embraced by him and she backs off. Then we, we cut and we tilted the camera so she's not standing up against the wall. We tilt the camera so it's like he's laying her on the floor. She, he's not, but the in essence is we move in and twist. So, and that, unfortunately, I, I like that scene, but we took it out of the movie. Deck seven.
seek out new life and new civilizations. Except from Cochrane's own words. You know, when Charles Darwin set out on the HMS Beagle, he sailed without a single musket. That was another time. How far we've come. Let me know if you need anything. John Luke. He is not you. Martin Madden. I'm the new first officer. Commander. Uh, sir, I, I haven't met the captain yet. I was hoping that you could give me a little insight. Well, the most important thing about Captain Picard is he's not a by-the-book type officer. He likes to keep things casual. In fact, if you want to get on his good side, call him Jean-Luc. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Commander Martin Madden, reporting for duty, sir. Welcome aboard, Commander. I hope your transfer didn't take you too much by surprise. I feel privileged, sir. I needed you immediately in order to oversee the refits, as you can see. We have a lot to discuss. Why don't we say dinner in my quarters, 1900 hours? Very good, Jean-Luc. Captain Riker was pulling my leg, wasn't he? Sir. Sir, what's this? It's the Mark VII, Captain. State-of-the-art ergonomics, command interface... I told him that you were comfortable with your old chair. Well, let's uh, give it a try. Feels good. Try that button, sir. <laughs> About time. Well, Commander. You'll be pleased to hear that we have our first assignment. We're going to be exploring the Denap system. It uh, should be interesting. <laughs> 